Night with a Vampire. Good evening. Please leave the light on. The first of our nightly vigils will take place in the company of a French abbot, Dom Augustine Calme, who compiled a natural history of the vampire in his 18th century dissertation on the phantom world. Of all our witnesses, Calme is the most matter of fact. He is not embroidering a fantastical tale, as he himself insists. He is simply recounting events which may really have happened. My aim is not to foment superstition, nor to feed the vain curiosity of visionaries and those who believe without examination everything that is related to them as soon as they find therein anything marvellous and supernatural. I write only for reasonable and unprejudiced minds, which examine things seriously and coolly. I speak only for those who assent even to known truth only after mature reflection, who know how to doubt of what is uncertain, to suspend their judgment on what is doubtful, and to deny what is manifestly false. I have always been much struck with what was related of the vampires or ghosts of Hungary, Moravia and Poland, of the Vrukolakas of Greece, and of the excommunicated who are said not to rot. The subject of the return of vampires is worthy of the attention of the curious and learned, and deserves to be seriously studied, to have the facts related of it examined, and the causes, circumstances and means sounded deeply. Every age, every nation, every country has its prejudices, its maladies, its customs which characterise them, and which pass away. In this age, a new scene presents itself to our eyes, in Hungary, Moravia, Silesia and Poland they see, it is said, men who have been dead for several months come back to earth, talk, walk, infest villages, ill-use both men and beasts, suck the blood of their near relations, make them ill and finally cause their death, so that people can only save themselves from their dangerous visits and their hauntings by exhuming them, impaling them, cutting off their heads, tearing out the heart or burning them. These revenants are called by the name of upires or vampires, and such particulars are related of them, so singular, so detailed, and invested with such probable circumstances and such judicial information that one can hardly refuse to credit the belief which is held in those countries, that these revenants come out of their tombs and produce those effects which are proclaimed of them. I have been told by the late Monsieur de Vassimont that having been sent into Moravia by his late Royal Highness Leopold, he was informed by public report that it was common enough in that country to see men who had died some time before present themselves in a party and sit down to table with persons of their acquaintance without saying anything, but that nodding to one of the party, he would infallibly die some days afterwards. This fact was confirmed by several persons, and, amongst others, by an old curé, who said he had seen more than one instance of it. The bishops and priests of the country consulted Rome on so extraordinary a fact, but they received no answer, because, apparently, all those things were regarded there as simple visions or popular fancies. They afterwards bethought themselves of taking up the corpses of those who came back in that way, of burning them, or of destroying them in some other manner. Thus, they delivered themselves from the importunity of these spectres, which are now much less frequently seen than before. These apparitions have given rise to a little work entitled Magia Postuma, printed at Olmutz in 1706, composed by Charles Ferdinand de Schertz. The author relates that, in a certain village, a woman being just dead, who had taken all her sacraments, was buried in the usual way in the cemetery. Four days after her decease, the inhabitants of this village heard a great noise and extraordinary uproar, and saw a spectre, which appeared sometimes in the shape of a dog, sometimes in the form of a man, not to one person only, but to several, and caused them great pain, grasping their throats and compressing their stomachs so as to suffocate them. 
It bruised almost the whole body and reduced them to extreme weakness so that they became pale, lean and attenuated. The spectre attacked even the animals and some cows were found debilitated and half dead. Sometimes it tied them together by their tails. These animals gave sufficient evidence by their bellowing of the pain they suffered. The horses seemed overcome with fatigue or in a perspiration principally on the back, heated, out of breath, covered with foam as they are after a long and rough journey. These calamities lasted several months. The author whom I have mentioned examines the affair in a lawyer-like way and reasons much on the fact and the law. He asks if, supposing that those disturbances, those noises and vexations proceeded from that person who is suspected of causing them, they should burn her, as is done to other ghosts who do harm to the living. He relates several instances of similar apparitions and of the evils which ensued, as of a shepherd of the village of Blow, near the town of Kadam in Bohemia, who appeared during some time and called certain persons who never failed to die within eight days after. The peasants of Blow took up the body of this shepherd and fixed it in the ground with a stake which they drove through it. This man, when in that condition, derided them for what they made him suffer and told them they were very good to give him thus a stick to defend himself from the dogs. The same night he got up again and by his presence alarmed several persons and strangled more amongst them than he had hitherto done. Afterwards, they delivered him into the hands of the executioner who put him in a cart to carry him beyond the village and there burn him. This corpse howled like a madman and moved his feet and hands as if alive. And when they again pierced him through with stakes, he uttered very loud cries and a great quantity of bright vermilion blood flowed from him. At last he was consumed and this execution put an end to the appearance and the hauntings of this spectre. The same has been practised in other places where similar ghosts have been seen and when they have been taken out of the ground they have appeared red with their limbs supple and pliable without worms or decay but not without a great stink. The author cites divers other writers who attest what he says of these spectres which still appear, he says, pretty often in the mountains of Silesia and Moravia. They are seen by night and by day. The things which once belonged to them are seen to move themselves and change their place without being touched by anyone. The only remedy for these apparitions is to cut off the heads and burn the bodies of those who come back to haunt people. At any rate, they do not proceed to this without a form of justicial law. They call for and hear the witnesses. They examine the arguments. They look at the exhumed bodies to see if they can find any of the usual marks which lead them to conjecture that these are the parties who molest the living. Marks such as the mobility and suppleness of the limbs, the fluidity of the blood and the flesh remaining uncorrupted. If all these marks are found, then these bodies are given up to the executioner who burns them. It sometimes happens that the spectres appear again for three or four days after the execution. Sometimes the internment of the bodies of suspicious persons is deferred for six or seven weeks. When they do not decay and their limbs remain as supple as when they were alive, then they burn them. About 15 years ago, a soldier who was billeted at the house of a peasant on the frontiers of Hungary, as he was one day sitting at a table near the master of the house, saw a person he did not know come in and sit down to table also with them. The master of the house was strangely frightened at this, as were the rest of the company. The soldier knew not what to think of it, being ignorant of the matter in question. But the master of the house being dead the very next day, the soldier inquired what it meant. They told him that it was the body of the father of his host who had been dead and buried for ten years, which had thus come to sit down next to him, and had announced and caused his death. The soldier informed the regiment of it in the first place, and the regiment gave notice of it to the general officers, who commissioned the Count de Cabreras to make information concerning this circumstance. Having gone to the place with some other officers, a surgeon and an auditor, they heard the depositions of all the people belonging to the house, who attested unanimously that the ghost was the father of the master of the house and that all the soldier had said and reported was the exact truth which was confirmed by all the inhabitants of the village. 
in consequence of this, the corpse of this spectre was exhumed and found to be like that of a man who had just expired and his blood like that of a living man. The Count de Cabreras had his head cut off and caused him to be laid again in his tomb. He also took information concerning other similar ghosts, amongst others, of a man dead more than thirty years who had come back three times to his house at mealtime. The first time he had sucked the blood from the neck of his own brother, the second time from one of his sons, and the third from one of the servants in the house. And all three died of it instantly and on the spot. Upon this deposition, the commissary had this man taken out of his grave and finding that, like the first, his blood was in a fluid state, like that of a living person, he ordered them to run a large nail into his temple and then to lay him again in the grave. He caused a third to be burnt, who had been buried more than sixteen years and had sucked the blood and caused the death of two of his sons. The commissary, having made his report to the general officers, was deputed to the court of the emperor who commanded that some officers, both of war and justice, some physicians and surgeons, and some learned men, should be sent to examine the causes of these extraordinary events. In the beginning of September, there died in the village of Kivsiloa, three leagues from Graditz, an old man who was 62 years of age. Three days after he had been buried, he appeared in the night to his son and asked him for something to eat. The son, having given him something, he ate and disappeared. The next day, the son recounted to his neighbours what had happened. That night, the father did not appear, but the following night he showed himself and asked for something to eat. They know not whether the son gave him anything or not, but the next day he was found dead in his bed. On the same day, five or six persons fell suddenly ill in the village and died one after the other in a few days. The officer or bailiff of the place, when informed of what had happened, sent an account of it to the tribunal of Belgrade, which dispatched to the village two of these officers and an executioner to examine into this affair. The imperial officer from whom we have this account repaired thither from Graditz to be witness of a circumstance which he had so often heard spoken of. They opened the graves of those who had been dead six weeks. When they came to that of the old man, they found him with his eyes open, having a fine colour, with natural respiration, nevertheless motionless as the dead. Whence they concluded that he was most evidently a vampire. The executioner drove a stake into his heart. They then raised a pile and reduced the corpse to ashes. No mark of vampirism was found either on the corpse of the son or on the others. Thanks be to God, we are by no means credulous. We avow that all the light which physics can throw on this fact discovers none of the causes of it. Nevertheless, we cannot refuse to believe that to be true, which is juridically attested, and by persons of probity. Tomorrow night, I shall tell you of the family of the Vordalac. Sleep well, if you can. <laughs>